Well, good morning and welcome back to the Broadcast Retirement Network. I'm Jeff Snyder, and this is BRN AM for Friday, December 11th, 2020. And our top story today, big ideas that could shape 2021. Joining me now to discuss this and more is Devin Banerjee. He's Senior Financial Services Editor for LinkedIn. He's also the editor of the This Week in Finance newsletter, which of course you can find on the LinkedIn platform. Devin, great to see you. Thanks for joining us on the program this morning. Absolutely, Jeff. Always good to chat. Yeah, we really enjoy how you wrap up and analyze all the social media trends for us. And, you know, you just do it in 16 minutes, Devin. So it's great to it's great to have you back. So let's let's jump in, because one of the things that I know that you and the team are working on at LinkedIn is the top big ideas for 2021. And I'm really this is very interesting. I want to hear what you and the team have to say. Absolutely, Jeff. You mentioned top social media trends. We've taken those trends from 2020, as well as our reporting, as well as what some of our most influential members on the LinkedIn platform were talking about and turned it into 24 big ideas or predictions, you might call them, for the coming year, which of course we are just a couple of weeks away from. So in this first segment, I'm going to talk about uh, some related to uh, global dynamics and, and entrepreneurship. And then in the second segment, uh, doing your job a little bit for you, Jeff, we will get into some of the ideas specific to the finance, economics, and investing space. But let me kick off with a couple. As I said, there are 24 in total. But one of them that we really focused on was this pandemic will unleash a new wave of entrepreneurs. If you think about last decade's Great Recession, that set off a wave of entrepreneurialism as high unemployment encouraged, you know, would be business owners to pursue their own great ideas rather than relying on that turbulent job market. We saw in Silicon Valley, uh, juggernauts being spawned like Slack, Uber and Airbnb in the wake of that downturn. And we think based on our reporting and some of the people we've spoken with that we can expect the same when the dust settles from this crisis. As a matter of fact, we're, we're actually already seeing that begin, as you and I have spoken about, Jeff, um, you know, with scores of restaurants and retailers permanently shuttering without a, a viable comeback, frontline workers are launching, uh, you know, ventures like traveling hair salons, virtual workout classes. And as we've spoken about, we've seen here in the U.S. new business applications, which, um, uh, you know, entrepreneurs and and would-be entrepreneurs have to file with the IRS for tax purposes, we've seen those new business applications skyrocket almost 40% year over year as of, as of about mid-November. And so we're seeing this already occurring. Uh, Lucy Chow, who's a senator representing the UAE at the World Business Angels Investment Forum, who, who we spoke with, said, we'll start to see more people step, step off the corporate ladder and start their own businesses, probably at an accelerated pace like we haven't seen before. So that, that was one very important big idea that um, got a lot of attention. Another one I'll mention is about China. Um, China really grabbing the spotlight in 2021. Um, you know, we, 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 here in the US, we've been so busy containing our own economic downturn and this health pandemic that yes, is affecting the globe, but we haven't really realized many of us that China really had a blockbuster year despite the pandemic originating on its shores, as we remember, uh, they, they really tamped down um, on that pandemic, uh, shut down the country effectively enough so that things are kind of almost ha have been back to normal in recent weeks and months there from a health perspective. The economy also quickly rebounded. It grew by about 4.3% in the third quarter. Um, and, and, and things, as I said, are, are coming back to normal thanks to those, those strict lockdowns. And so all of this puts China in a really prime position to secure a spot as a dominant superpower for, for, for years to come. In addition, it, it joined uh, one of the world's largest trading packs that uh, you and I spoke about on the podcast a couple of weeks ago. And you know, the, meanwhile, the United States and Europe are setting themselves up for next year to spend a lot of time and resources containing the virus, containing these infections and, and trying to, uh, to re-stimulate their economy. So as I said, this really sets China up to, to have a strong um, 2021. But part of our big idea, which uh, my colleague Jordan Dahl uh, really reported out very well, is that um, 
you know, for years, China has used its economic power, its economic might as a bargaining chip to gain access to new markets or to quiet criticism over human rights violations. And based on her reporting, she thinks that those things could come back to, to, to bite China um, and, 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 and could be a, a, a liability for China as it tries to open up again and, and allow global business and industry in. Indeed, negative sentiment toward China is already on the rise, according to uh, Pew, uh, which does the, 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 the Pew research surveys. Um, that negative sentiment toward China is already on the rise in places like Germany, Australia, South Korea, and the United States and Canada. So it's going to be really interesting to see China's economy rebound uh, quite um, in, in quite a healthy way relative to other economies. But that negative sentiment may come back to to bite the country and the and the and the Chinese and, and, the, and the Chinese Communist Party. Yeah, I want to go back to the, the first uh, big idea. I, I agree with you um, in terms of what you articulated. We'll come back in a second. But in terms of the uh, starting new businesses, I, I guess on one hand, uh, you've seen job cl- job numbers not be really great in terms of creation of jobs, job claims or unemployment claims going up. But I guess it makes me feel better that people aren't just sitting <laughs> sitting around waiting for someone to come with me with a jo- to them with a job. I should say they're actually creating something now. When you go and create a business, it's not like you just get a loan and you create a business and it just is successful. There's a lot of time, effort, there's a ramp up period, there's maybe capital that you have to invest. But the thing that oftentimes small business owners forget about is employee benefits, uh, either for themselves in terms of retirement and healthcare. That's a big part of what an expen- of corporate expenditure, Devin. That's a, that's a very important point, Jeff. And you, of course, are a uh, perfect voice to speak about that, given that you are an entrepreneur yourself. And so, yes, this 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 big idea, and and this is why we call them big ideas, because obviously you can drill down, and there's so much nuance to each of these stories. But we're seeing this as as an overall trend. Those new business applications pick up the signs that that will continue, like it did after the after the last downturn. But it's a great point to to viewers who are thinking about this that there's so much thinking and planning that goes into it, and also success is surely not guaranteed, not even close to guaranteed. And in fact, I, I, I think I, I would have to take a look at the data, but probably a majority of new ventures do not last um, you know, you know, some, some X number uh, of years. And it's very important to think about benefits. And if you're going to be hiring people for the first time, employing people for the first time, there are a lot of important considerations. You and I have spoken about some, I won't call it innovation, but some progress on that front, especially as it relates to uh, multiple employer plans for, as, as, for, for, for for retirement saving and investing. So there's a lot of education that entrepreneurs have to do themselves because they're not just trying to execute on their business plan and, and, and put out their great product or service or offering into the world. They have to be a, a CEO, a business. They're the CEO, the CFO, the COO and everything and the head of human resources in one. Yeah, and, and, and actually have to do the work after that too. Uh, Devin, back on China, I mean, would you expect, uh, I, I, would, I would expect, and I want to get your opinion on this, with the recent growth in, in the Chinese economy, kind of the rebound, would you expect a lot of foreign investment? I mean, I know you had some, uh, said that there's some negative sentiment and expect negative sentiment and, 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 and rightfully so for a lot of the reasons that you articulated, but would you expect more foreign investment to continue as asset management firms and investors in general are just looking for more and more opportunities in not only China, but places like India and other parts of the world. Would that ramp up as well? I, I absolutely think so. I think the big tension that um, many of us see all the time is that, the, is, is that there is this negative sentiment, especially toward uh, the Chinese government's approach toward human rights, of course, but it is such a large market, right? It is such a large business opportunity. I mean, we've seen so many companies, um, especially uh, here in Silicon Valley, the big tech companies, um, try to to tackle and penetrate this market. But we see it in the finance and investing space as well. Of course, all the major global financial services firms have a footprint there. In fact, just earlier this week, um, I believe Bloomberg reported that Goldman Sachs, uh, which which operates kind of with a joint venture uh, in China, is will, will now try to um, take 100% control ownership of that joint venture and the, and the Chinese government is going along with that. So I think our sense is that the Chinese government is evaluating many of these big MNCs, multinational corporations, and basically seeing 
which of them is the lowest threat to China or, or the safest bet and allowing them to enter the market even more. But it comes with compromise and it comes yeah. with probably uh, uh, backdoor MOUs, uh, memorandums of, of, of understanding regarding criticizing the, you know, criticizing the government or speaking out about the government's policies and approaches toward its citizens and human rights. So it's going to be a really, it, it, this has been happening for a couple of years, but it's coming to a point where the Chinese market is, is recovering uh, well relative to other markets and growing so fast. And these big companies are going to want to, you know, find a way to enter that market. Yeah, really interesting. It's something, definitely a big trend that we'll have to watch going forward in 2021. Well, let's take a quick break, Devin. We come back, we're going to turn our attention to economics and finance and find out some big ideas there. So you're going to want to stay tuned right here on BRN AM. Imagine a new television network that will make you richer, healthier, and in control of your financial future. This network is for the policewoman in Nashville, Tennessee, the baker in Dubuque, Iowa, the teacher in Lexington, Kentucky. We wanna make the idea of savings and retirement culturally relevant. But what do you see as a defining issue of the midterms? Especially for the smaller businesses, I mean, they are the lifeblood of the American economy. Featuring exclusive interviews, current affairs, and docu-series. 33 yeah. years old, you retired early. The philosophy is money only matters if it helps you live a life that you love. But you gotta start thinking about retirement as soon as you get in. The Broadcast Retirement Network will drive very high engagement with premium partnerships. So this isn't retirement and savings for your parents or grandparents. This is for all Americans. And we're gonna change the way you think about money. Welcome to the next frontier of retirement and savings. This is BRN, the Broadcast Retirement Network. Hi folks, Joe Namath here, and if you're on Medicare, this is important. You're now entitled to eliminate co-pays and get dental care, dentures, eyeglasses, prescription coverage, in-home aids, unlimited transportation, and home-delivered meals all at no additional cost. Plus, your zip code may have coverage with a give back benefit that adds money back to your social security check every month. Look, with the uncertainty of the virus and vaccines, you need to get everything you're entitled to. Here's the bottom line. Call to get significant benefits at no additional cost and see if your zip code has coverage with the give back benefit. Millions of people have trusted the Medicare Coverage Helpline. You can too. Call now. It's free. Call 1-800-924-3920. That's 1-800-924-3920. Welcome back. We're talking to Devin Banerjee of LinkedIn. Devin, thanks as always for sticking around with us this morning. Absolutely, Jeff. Happy to. So we talked about more global themes or they were kind of economic and international themes. But let's let's hone in on, if we could, economic and financial themes in this segment. Absolutely, Jeff. So yeah, it's just uh, stepping back, as I said, 24 big ideas that we've put out there from the LinkedIn editorial team based on our reporting and what our influential members are talking about. So we talked about a couple in the first segment. There are many more I should just mention uh, for, for, for people to take a look at, ones related to travel for next year, ones related to Brexit, uh, to healthcare, and, and, and how this pandemic will change the healthcare industry. There's, some, there's, there's one related to Brexit that's really interesting, which is occurring right now in a very messy way. Um, but let's focus in on three uh, that, that I actually put together for this list based, uh, uh, about trends in finance and economics. The first is really, you know, and, and th there's this bifurcation in the economy occurring, of, of, of course, uh, especially between the stock market and the economy. But going through our reporting and talking to a lot of people, one of our big ideas is to get ready for 
this Global Recession Act II. And so, you know, a, a year that's produced no shortage of surprises, of course, coming to a close, but economists are already starting to signal this surprise for 2021, which is a double dip recession. Um, and you and I spoke about this a couple of months ago, um, based on economist Ernie uh, Tedeschi's uh, trends that he's been putting out there, which is an underlying recession, a more fundamental recession is beginning to take hold or a recession within a recession or a Russian doll recession. There's so many terms that economists like to use, of course. So what are some of the signs of this? There are a couple that are really important. The first is that industries that weren't directly affected by the health crisis that started all of this uh, are now starting to experience those job losses, those business failures, those declines in spending. Um, and so it's starting to spread beyond just the immediate impacted uh, industries that were affected by the health crisis. Also, more layoffs that were originally classified as temporary are beginning to be classified as permanent. We actually saw this just a week ago with the, no with, with the jobs report for November. Uh, we saw that continue, and it's, it's been about three to four months where that long-term uh, unemployment rate, which is a disturbing hallmark of the last, rece of the last recession, the Great Recession, uh, is on the rise. So the implication here is that this is, is that a double dip recession is, is the greatest risk for 2021. That's according to economist uh, Cam Harvey, who you and I also spoke about a couple of weeks ago. He was number one on our on our top voices list. Other economists like Mohammed El Arian agree with that, and uh, Mohammed in particular deems that risk of a subsequent recession or a double dip recession high and rising based on global data he's watching from the manufacturing and services sectors. So something, of course, all of us are going to want to keep an eye on. There are human implications for this. The United Nations just earlier this week appealed for $35 billion to support its humanitarian work, projecting that you know a record number of people are going to need assistance in 2021, about 235 million people uh, the UN expects will need humanitarian assistance. So that's the first big idea I'll mention. And so let's keep an eye on that going into the new year. Um, the second of the three is actually one that you and I did also speak about, which is millennials, this millennial gener generation really rising in clout, especially as it relates to the investment management industry. And that those, this millennial generation may be able to remake that industry in its own image. And so I, I, there, there are four big trends within this big idea that, that we're tracking. The first is that millennials are about to enter their peak earning years of their careers. So they're starting to climb the corporate ladder. They're replacing retiring baby boomers. So Bank of America research finds that these millennials earning power will jump by almost 75% this decade. Uh, the second trend in there is that boomers are not only retiring. I mean, as, as you know, Jeff, unfortunately, they're also passing away as well. And that flow of inheritance from baby boomers to millennials is only poised to accelerate. In fact, according to Cerulli Associates, that flow is expected to double um, in just the next 10 to 15 years. Um, a, 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 a third trend is that technology is really, is really ever more front and center in millennials' lives, of course. And so according to The Economist, you know, this millennial generations are much more likely to, uh, turn, to, to turn to a smartphone and turn to an app to figure out investing and saving and budgeting and all of that, rather than trusting a, a, a well-heeled broker for trading and investing or a financial advisor for saving and budgeting. And then finally, what the, the way they're really gonna remake the industry is because they care about many other things besides just a financial return. Of course, they do care about a financial return, but some of them care about other things even more. So Morgan Stanley Research has found that people under the age of 35 are twice as likely to sell a stock if they consider a company to be environmentally or socially uh, unsustainable. And so uh, Christina Hooper, the chief global market strategist at Invesco, who, who I spoke with for this item, really expects that con to continue. She sees ESG as top and uh, as, as, as uh, front and center and top of mind for all of her new clients, especially in that younger generation. Yeah, look, I, I think that there's a lot of merit to what you're describing. And I think, uh, look, every generation has its focus, Devin, on what's important to them. Um, I don't think this, by the way, has to be in a conflict. I think it's just a matter of prioritization. You know, clearly, the ESG sustainability discussion is one that is just, uh, you know, flying into the clouds, right? I mean, it is just something that is just really taken off. You've seen assets grow 
significantly this year and in years past. Um, and, and so th that would be a, a top priority um, for, for certainly millennials. What about, uh, you mentioned technology, uh, apps like Robinhood, right? And others where people are, are now trading online. They're, you mentioned they're not consulting brokers or using robo-advisors like Betterment and other services. I mean, this is, and I, and I also think it's not just millennials. I think it's people, you know, Gen X like myself, or even some boomers. People are looking at, they've adopted new technology during this pandemic. So I think that this, this is, I think you're right on. I think it's, but I think it's a trend that's just beyond not just millennials. I think, I think collectively we are rein, rein, reinventing investing in finance. Yeah, <clears throat> that's absolutely right. I mean, consumer adoption of technology across generations, of course, is on the rise. And so this, uh, you know, I think when we look back at like at centuries uh, and or, or, or 50 year periods, I think all generations 50 years from now will be entirely, you know, uh, operating on, on smartphones effectively for, for everything in their personal life. And it's not just consumer adoption of technology. As I mentioned, there's a third idea we had related to finance uh, and economics. And and this one is really more related to um, to business operations as well, which is that businesses will um, really look to court the wealthy a lot more in this K-shaped recovery. So of course, you know, one leg of the K is going up, the other leg's going down. If you're a business, you want to ride that upper leg of the K. You want to court people who are doing well uh, financially right now. And so it's a bit unfortunate, but that is fr from, a, from a company standpoint, what they wanna do. And so we're seeing, you know, movie theaters that have been sitting largely empty, start to look to private screenings to fill that gap or hotel chains are looking to, you know, well-to-do workers seeking private offices overlooking the beach. Um, we're even seeing um, uh, uh, dollar stores targeting wealthier customers. Um, dollar General has has has, has uh, rolled out a, a new brand of stores called Pop Shelf aimed at more affluent shoppers. And the implication, as I said, for, for companies is that the makeup of them will change as well. David Hunt, who's the CEO of PGM, the big asset manager who I spoke with for this idea, Things that companies are across the globe will shed assets that have historically defined them, like factories, machinery, or regional offices teeming with people. And instead, they're going to heavily invest in intellectual property, software, online digital platforms, and proprietary data and algorithms, all in the effort to track and meet these customers, the wealthy customers, to follow the money, if you will, to meet these customers where they are. Um, and so that is really changing the makeup of companies as well as this K-shaped recovery continues. Yeah, I think that last one, Devin, I think it's all about the data. I mean, it, you know, yeah. when, you, when it comes to targeting and being able to target certain demographics and be able to look at people's uh, purchasing habits are, I think that is some, and as long as you can act on it. I mean, it's one thing to collect it. It's another thing if you can actually act on it. I think if you can be a company that collects that information or gathers that information and then can develop strategies to act upon it, you're obviously going to be more successful and you're going to be ahead of your peers. Yeah, we've heard the phrase data is the new oil from so many people we uh, interviewed for, for, for this list of uh, big ideas. And so that's, that's absolutely the future. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Devin, always a pleasure chatting with you and uh, look forward to chatting with you again. I know next week you're, you're going to be awesome. We'll have a, uh, a very special guest. We're not going to say exactly who that is just yet, but... Devin, we wish you the best. As always, great talking with you, and uh, we look forward to talking with you again very soon. Thanks, Jeff. Take care. And that wraps up this episode of BRN AM. Have a topic of interest or someone you think we should talk to? Then drop us a line. And don't forget, for all the news in retirement markets, technology, personal finance, so much more, check out today's edition of our newsletter, The Morning Pulse. Don't forget, we're back again tomorrow for BRN Weekly. We'll be taking a look at some of our best segments for the week and have a very special interview planned. So until then, I'm Jeff Snyder. Stay safe, keep on saving, and don't forget, roll with the changes. Are you being audited? And do you owe the IRS $10,000 or more in back taxes? Is the IRS threatening to take more of your money? Don't fight the IRS alone. The Tax Doctor is here to help you negotiate your tax bill and reduce your stress. The IRS can freeze your assets and seize your bank accounts. 
but you can stop these IRS actions. The Tax Doctor will work with you using our years of experience to represent your case to help you get the best resolution under the IRS guidelines. Help is here to deal with the IRS to reduce your stress. We've handled thousands of cases, so we know what we're doing. If you owe $10,000 or more in back taxes, do not call the IRS alone. Call a tax doctor now for a tax emergency analysis. Call 800-224-6439.